For the past two years, my fantasy basketball teams have not been doing very well. It's felt like I can't catch a break with these injuries. Since it's the last year that I'll be playing fantasy basketball with these friends, I need to win. What if I was able to use statistics to predict injuries? Then maybe I could finally have a healthy team and have a chance of beating everyone else. First, I wanted to see how physical attributes like height, weight, or vertical would affect a player's likelihood of getting injured. However, these measurements are usually taken right before a player gets drafted, so they don't account for how they change over their time in the league. They also don't show the full story, as there can be two players with similar measurements and completely different playstyles. For example, Grayson Allen and Josh Hart have pretty similar measurements, but Grayson Allen reigns threes while Josh Hart crashes the boards. It's clear that players with similar measurements can play completely differently, so I need to find a different method. What if I use a player's stats per season? Just including points, rebounds, and assists might not give a full picture, so I decided to include more stats like minutes per game, usage rate, fouls drawn, block shots, and many more. I also wanted to see how a player's shot selection would affect their injury risk, so I decided to keep track of their shot distribution over four categories, less than eight feet, eight to 16 feet, 16 to 24 feet, and 24 plus feet. All of these made up my independent variables, and I decided to make my dependent variable whether they had a season ending injury or not. But how could I track season ending injuries? Thankfully, there's a Kaggle data set that kept track of every single injury from 1950 all the way to 2023. In it, I just checked whether the injury message said out for season, and if it did, then it counted as a season ending injury. The only exception was April, where an injury that kept someone out for maybe a week is still counted as season ending, and in that case, I just made sure to not count it. Tracking every player and every season would take forever, especially because I'm using the NBA API rather than an offline data set. Since I didn't want to spend weeks collecting data, I decided to limit my selection of players to every all-star over the last 20 years, since the 2005-2006 season. By taking their entire career, this left me with 120 players, 14 20 seasons, and 70 season-ending injuries. Once I had my players, I used the injury data set to map each player to all their season-ending injuries and when they happened. This meant that when I started tracking each player's season stats, I could call the dictionary to check whether they had a season ending injury and if they did, when it happened. After this, all I had to do was call the API and let my program start collecting data. I think now is a good time to explain what Cox Proportional Hazards is and why I chose it. What I'm trying to do is called survival prediction, as I want to see the probability of a player making it to the end of the season without a season ending injury. This model shows me which factors influence injury risk the most, so I can keep them in mind while I'm drafting. It also allows me to run simulations, so I can keep checking in on players throughout the season. It also allows me to account for data censoring. Data censoring is when an observation gets cut off, such as when the season is over. Since they can't play any more games, I don't know how long it will take for a player to get injured after 82 games. Fortunately, cost proportional hazards is okay with this. The model basically starts with a baseline injury risk and then adjusts it up or down depending on things like height, rebounds, fouls, and the weights that are correspondent to them. Before I use the cost proportional hazards model, I should check whether my data follows three assumptions. Number one is that the hazard ratio is constant for two individuals over time. We can check this using the Schoenfeld residual test, which sees if there's a trend over time for any parameter in its relation to injury risk. The only variable that fails this is the season variable. This means that players face a steeper increase in injury risk as the season progresses in 2025 than they did in 2015 or even 2005. However, every other variable passes this test, so we're okay. Number two is that all data censoring must be non-informative. Like I said earlier, I do have a lot of censored data as players can't play more than 82 games. However, all of the censoring is non-informative as all players are cut off at 82 games no matter their injury risk. Number three is that each observation must be independent. Each observation in this case isn't completely independent as there may be a relationship between prior injuries and future ones. However, I couldn't find a solution that works without trimming down the data set too much, so I'll just have to accept this as a source of error. Now that you know what cost proportional hazards is and why I chose it, let's see what the model gives us. I fit the model on the data and got these values. The hazard ratio is the effect on injury risk for each unit increase. For example, each 1 inch increase in height results in a 31.4% increase in injury risk. The 95% CIs are the confidence intervals and represent the range in which we are 95% certain that the hazard ratio falls into. Once again for height, we are 95% certain that there is between a 10.8% and 55.8% increase in injury risk. Finally, the p-value is the statistical significance. A p-value less than 0.05 means it's significant enough to draw conclusions from. 
From the table, we can gather the height, field goals made, rebounds, blocked shots, fouls committed, fouls drawn, and points are all variables with p-values less than 0.05, indicating a strong relation. Taking a look at the forest plot, we can see confidence intervals more clearly. Because fouls committed, blocked shots, and field goals made have such high ranges of confidence intervals, I decided to not explore them for my conclusions. I can't reasonably find the specific effect of each variable on injury risk because the uncertainty is so high for those three. That being said, I know that height, rebounds, fouls drawn, and points are all still valuable variables. By creating a mean profile, I've found that the average survival probability for an average all-star over the past 20 years is 96.5%. This makes sense as that would account for about one season ending injury for any year's set of 24 All-Stars. To display the effect of these variables, I'll take three different players and their season stats. 2025 Giannis, 2025 Scotty Barnes, and 2025 Stephen Curry. For each variable, I'll take the mean profile and adjust only that variable to match each of these three players. As I said earlier, each extra inch in height is associated with a 31.4% increase in injury hazard. As is seen in this graph, if we take the average all-star and make them 6'11 like Giannis, their survival likelihood is 89%, while the survival likelihood of a 6'3 player like Curry is almost 99%. More rebounds is also associated with a 19% lower injury hazard per unit increase. This can be seen in this graph, which shows that a player who averages 12 rebounds like Giannis has a 99.5% chance of survival, where a 4.4 rebound player like Curry has only a 94.2% chance. Fouls drawn also has a strong positive relation with injury risk as well. This probably makes the most sense as we've seen the effect of chronic foul baiting on players like Embiid. If we make the average player draw 7.57 fouls per game like Giannis did, they have only a 55% chance of survival. This is way less than the 96% chance of survival with Curry's 3.53 fouls per game. Finally, points scored has a strong negative relation with injury risk. However, this could be due to the relation between points scored and proximity to the end of a player's career, which would, might result in more season-ending injuries. Nevertheless, for each player, the survival probability is still above 99.5%, so it's not really anything to worry about. Finally, I wanted to do a test on each of those three players' complete profile. I used their stats from the 2024-25 season, and if you think you can predict who was the most likely to survive, then pause the video right now and take a guess. I hope that you paused the video and took a guess, because it might not be who you're expecting. The results say that Scotty Barnes had a 71.9% chance of survival last season. Curry had an 86.3% chance, and Giannis a 94.4% chance. You might be confused about these numbers, especially because it seems like Giannis should be cooked after taking his fouls drawn into account. However, that graph was for taking the average all-star and applying Giannis' ability to draw fouls. But we know that Giannis is far from the average all-star or even MVP with his strength and quickness, so it makes sense that he would survive the longest. Something that's equally as interesting as the relations that do exist are the ones that don't. Surprisingly, shot selection, position, and three-point attempts don't have any strong relation with injury risk in either direction. However, this may be because there isn't enough data, so I can't rule out that they may actually have an impact on injury risk. I'd also like to see how different injury types are affected. The injury dataset already has this information, so it shouldn't be too hard to figure out which area was injured. This could also be a lot more useful, as if a team knows that their 6'3 guard who averages 23 points and 4 rebounds has an increased risk of shoulder injury, then they could target that area during training to try and prevent it. I also assume that each season is independent when we know that it might not be. I'm not fully sure how I'd solve this, but something like a counter for a season since last major injury could help with the accuracy of the model. But while the model isn't perfect, it still gives me way more data than ESPN's projections. So I've talked a lot about statistics and data, but what does this mean for my fantasy draft? I've come up with four main takeaways. Number one is that high scorers are low risk. Number two is that shorter players survive longer. Number three is that foul baiters should be avoided, which is a little unfortunate for Harden fans. Number four is that rebounders are reliable. While I wasn't able to adhere to these rules completely, these are the players I ended up with. My higher draft picks, except Kevin Durant, were all shorter players. While I definitely have a few taller players, Again, with the exception of Kevin Durant, they're all good rebounders. Near the end of the draft, I tried to prioritize scorers like Devin Vassell and Cam Johnson. It's starting to seem like Kevin Durant might not have been a good choice now. 
Even though I can't really change anything now, I ran the prediction model on each player using their 2024-2025 season stats, with the exception of Ace Bailey as he's a rookie this year. I ended up with this. Most of my players are projected to do pretty well. It seems like I need a terrible accident for my team to be substantially affected. With the exception of Jalen Green, all my players are around or above 90% survival probability. I'm pretty happy about this. However, you might notice that there's one player missing, Kevin Durant. Let's add him to the graph. Yeah, it was definitely a mistake drafting him. Even if I don't win my fantasy league this year, I still learned a lot about survival prediction and Cox proportional hazards. It's a powerful tool for uncovering hidden relationships behind raw stats, but it depends on data quality and model assumptions. Whether you're studying injury risk in the NBA, testing the efficacy of a new drug, or evaluating some other long-term outcome, survival analysis can offer insights that simpler models might miss. And if the Rockets training staff want to hire me, then my DMs are open, because they're going to need all the help they can get with Kevin Durant.